full of all of this is to be able to do things, right? Down to earth, bottom line, get things done, right? We all the theory in the world, all the uh, emotion in the world, all the learning in the world, we got it grounded in action. Uh, and this is a really, really um, actionable takeaway, right? You sit in a corporate meeting and you're in an internship and they say, well, what's the actionable takeaway? Take We're gonna have quite a few, uh, but this one is something that I think is so fundamental, but sometimes we don't realize the depth and how much we can weave this idea into our lives on a day-to-day -day basis. So as you notice, you're not in my regular working learning space, um, teaching space. Um, we're actually in my hallway in my house and we're not doing a home tour. This is not reality TV, but this is reality mitzvah TV, right? Reality mitzvah learning, hands-on learning um, for people on the go. Um, so what are we doing today? We're gonna actually discuss the mitzvah of tzedakah. Now, I have to say, it's one of the mitzvot that are probably more popular. And by popular, I don't mean like trending, but I mean well-known, right? Um, as far as certain mitzvot that are better known and less, less, lesser known, this one's pretty well-known. And um, often when we think of tzedakah, the, the natural translation is charity, right? When essence, tzedakah is really not about charity. Charity is I am charitable or I am philanthropic and therefore I have and I will give. Really, the word tzedakah, in order to understand it, is tzedek. It's just, it's just it's the right thing to do, okay? So what is tzedakah and why is it so fundamental? Why is it such a Jewish value for so long? And how, as you said, we're trying to think how to do this day-to-day -day in our day-to-day -day life. How do we do that in our day-to-day -day life? How do I make tzedakah a part of me? So first of all, it's really important to understand that tzedakah is a value that's so ingrained in us as Jews and so a part of our life that we are meant to give tzedakah daily. It's not like, oh, I, um, you know, um, once a year there is going to be a fundraising campaign and that's when I'll be charitable. We're actually meant to be charitable every single day and it's meant to permeate our day-to-day -day routine, our day-to-day -day life, and the environment that we establish set up in our space. So I want to start here in my kitchen. Here's a little bit of leftover breakfast right there just for, this is real life. Um, we're starting off in my kitchen and um, I want to show you how tzedakah is meant to be a part of everyday life. And then we'll talk about how we do it and how to prioritize. And then we're going to talk about how to do this naturally. Um, and I guess we'll answer questions and we have a few more conversations. So I want to first start off with, right, clearly we're in the kitchen space. What's a kitchen? Okay, well, breakfast, a space that we gather, a space that we eat, a space that a family sits together, a space that it's all about what I'm eating, what I'm ingesting, what I'm enjoying, and maybe as a mom, what I'm creating for my family, what I'm nurturing and nourishing my family, not just like calories and nutrition like we talked about yesterday, but actually so much more than that. It's a space where as I'm talking all about the food that I'm going to eat and the meals that I have and the time I'm gonna spend with my family, I stop, I pause, I reflect. And do you see what's in the back? That's right, we'll get a close up of this. That is a Tadeka box. A Tadeka box anchored on the wall. Now, it's not an aesthetics thing, though, of course, the tzedakah box should be beautiful. Every mitzvah can be beautiful. It's actually the Lubavitcher Rebbe in, instituted a custom that we make the tzedakah a part of the home, literally a physical space in the home, part of that physical space. And I remember when I did a lot of studying about the environment being a teacher, that the environment that we set up, the things that we set up in our homes tell a story about us. I have to tell you, if you look up at these on the top, what story do you see? You may see that either I'm an artist, yikes, or you may see that I have children that have art. And over the years, we've put their art up as a way to send a message to them. This is their home. And we want to see what they create involved in their home. So if you look about it at a person's home and a person's space, it sends a story. Well, one of the messages we want to send to everyone who walks in here and to everyone who eats in this space is before we stop and think about ourselves, let's reflect and think about others. Someone who may not be able to sit down right now and have a delicious homemade dinner, or someone who may not even have a home or a family or a kitchen, 
We don't, eating is so often in society about myself. Who am I eating out with? What am I eating? What's on my diet? Even if I'm obsessed with the nutrition, whatever it is, it's about me. And at that moment, we stop and we think not about ourselves, we think about others. So tzedakah, this idea of being charitable, of taking coins, of giving daily, we do and we make sure it's represented and like we can see it, that vibe and that message sending a clear message that this is a home that's charitable. This is a home that's nurturing and nourishing and giving to others, not just ourselves. So we start in the kitchen. What's interesting also about Sadaka, which we got to keep in mind, is that we, there are so, there's actually laws about Sadaka, who to give, when to give, how to give, how much to give. Um, and there's a hierarchy of, of, you know, eight, like eight different levels of tzedakah, like, you know, lowest level is clearly giving what I don't want to give, but fine, I'll give it begrudgingly. And the highest level of tzedakah would actually be um, giving someone a job or a livelihood so they can live on their own and make their own money and they don't have to rely on charity. So that, so there is a hierarchy of giving, but it's so a part of our lives that we also want to make sure it's a part of our home. And I'm going to take you to the next spot. And one of the things that I've, we've done, my husband and I wanted this value, absolute, is this Sadaka box um, sits here all the time. And the reason it sits here all the time, and I'll actually tell you sometimes it moves, but I'll explain in a second. It's just a habit thing is I want to make sure and I put a thing of coins right there, right near it. So anyone who's passing by, anyone who walks in here knows stop, pause, and give tzedakah to the kids right when they start the day, before they eat breakfast, or before they're about to round the door um, to go learn, or before they are going to dive in, before they're going to talk to Hashem and talk about what their needs are and where they're holding and communicate with God with davening, with prayer. Stop, pause, take your right hand, we do mitzvot with our right hand, give it, peak pointed stuck, and I always make sure this is replenished. Do you see it's being used? But because it still has some coins in, always make sure it's full. Now, when does it move? This is just strategic, okay, here. When I notice that we forget that it's here. When I notice that we got so used to seeing it, I'll just pick up the coins and the thing and I'll move it to a different location in the kitchen or a different location in the house so that everyone, it's like, oh, wait, you know how sometimes you just get used to seeing things? Well, I don't want Tzedakah to be one of those things that we're just used to. I want it to constantly kind of be in your face, this idea and this value and this message of giving and giving to others regularly. Interestingly enough, we would want to give up at least one coin a day before prayer, um, absolutely every day of the week. What's amazing about giving tzedakah is what happens is, um, I'm just going to back up because of the lighting and the internet. I just want to make sure we have a good, clear internet so I don't get choppy. What actually happens is as we're giving tzedakah, something magnificent happens. It's so a core and such a value in Jewish life. In the Tanya, the Altar discusses how tzedakah is one of the highest mit levels of mitzvot because through giving tzedakah, I'm not just elevating the coin that I just gave, right? Can you say that See, again? Okay, I'm not just elevating the 25 cents or the quarter that I just put in. I'm not just bringing holiness and spirituality to the 25 cents that I just put in the, in the charity box, in the tzedakah box. So what am I actually doing? Here's an interesting idea. Um, we often have this notion that there's materialism, there's money, there's food, there's intimacy, there's materialism, and then there is spirituality, synagogue, God. There is like, there are two different worlds. And Judaism says, I can't do it because I'm using a selfie stick, which is so not me, but okay. Um, there actually has to be a fusion between the two. Every material item, money as well, yeah, can be holy. How do we make it holy? By elevating it, by giving to others, by using it the way God wants us to use it. When we give to Dhaka, we are not just elevating that quarter. I'm elevating the salary that, let's say, there's a part of the laws of Tadaka is giving a tenth. I remember my child once said to me, mommy, mommy, what's a tenth of a dollar. I'm like, a tenth of a dollar? Why do you need to know that? Well, I just got a dollar from the tooth fairy, the tooth malach, the tooth angel, and I want to give tzedakah. I want to give miser a tenth. Um, and so by us giving the, co the coin, she, that child is not just elevating the 10 cents that they're putting in the tzedakah box. They're elevating 
the 90 cents that they left behind because now that is elevated and holy. We can elevate money. And not just can we elevate money, but the altar he describes in Tanya, the fundamental principles of Chabad philosophy, um, is that in essence, when we, what, what did it take to get that dollar? I have a job, um, I go to work, so now there's hours in my time, my car that gets me there, my gas that I put in the car that gets me there, the food that I eat when I'm going to work, to have the energy to do the work that I need to do. All of those things we can elevate by using the money, the materialism that we gain, that we get from that action is elevatable. So tzedakah, that's why they say tzedakah is such a great mitzvah that it hastens the redemption. Delta tzedakah shem ha'karev says the brings the redemption closer. What's this redemption? This idea is a world that material and physical, the the awareness of how materialism and godliness is everywhere is so in our face. Well, tzedakah is exactly that. We're showing that all materialism has potential for spirituality. So tzedakah is a really, really high level mitzvah. And not only that, it's so fundamental, but we make sure we do it daily. So we're going to just move on quickly into my living room. And we all know a living room, okay, piano, we, a living room is a space where the family can gather and sit and relax and maybe, you know, enjoy, read a book, cozy up on the couch. And in, you know, in a living room is a space that's often about us. We want to make sure this message of, the message of Tzedakah is also a part of our lives. So I want to show you something here. Here is my husband's um, and my son's. This is their, during quarantine, this is the, this is the synagogue, our at-home synagogue. This is where everyone gathers. They're praying their books. They're, this is Friday night services right here. We're in a very holy space. Um, but what do we know? Here's my husband's um, feeling bad, right? In here is his talit that he puts on daily. And, and here is his talit and his tefillin in there. Um, and what else do we have in the a tefillin bag? What is this? This is a spec box. Before prayer, stop, stop, pause, reflect, think of others. I'm about to think of myself and my family and my needs and my connection to God. I'm about to think of, the, you know, Prayer is so personal. Well, at that moment, let's also think of others. Let's stop and think of who else is in need. Okay, so now we're going to swing around um, to a different area, and we're going to keep, keep talking about this incredible mitzvah, um, uh, real life, real children. Um, and thank God, um, everyone, not everyone, but most of us are home, which is the really good thing. Um, we're actually enjoying a lot of good family time. What else we need to know about tzedakah is we're going to move along to another spot in the house is what else we need to know about tzedakah is really every room should have a tzedakah box. And my children actually have in their own bedroom, their own tzedakah box. And most of some of them painted it, some of them decorated it, and some of them they can own and personalize the mitzvah. But what's amazing about this mitzvah is that, that it's so fundamental that I remember when my kids were little and they'd see a coin on the street, they wouldn't pick up and say, ooh, a dollar mine or ooh, a penny mine. They would say, oh, tzedakah. They define the coins by tzedakah because that was their first reference of what a coin is for, the purpose of a coin, the purpose of money. And so when we went to the pottery place in town, my daughter, when we first had moved here and she went there, she said, mommy, look, they have so many tzedakah boxes in this pottery place in College Station, Texas, like tzedakah boxes. And sure enough, there was a wall full of piggy banks. But this child, since tzedakah is so a part of our day-to-day -day life and our mindset and our psyche of giving and giving to others, to the child, it was, a, it was tzedakah boxes. Now, the last stop in the house that we're going to go to, and then we'll answer any questions. Happy to, because I know I'm throwing a lot out there. There's a lot of big ideas about this, but um, the last spot is right here. So you may recognize this spot if you've gone to any classes, right? Because usually where am I? I'm sitting down right over here. This is the other side of the camera teaching, right? So this is the background. This is, has good natural sunlight. It's a quietish space. Um, but what do I have here? Sometimes I'm blocking it. I have here my Shabbat candles. Now they're not set up yet. They will be by tomorrow for Shabbat. And what do I have before Shabbat? Again, Shabbat is a time that what am I doing? I'm lighting candles. 
I'm bringing in light. And when I light them, I'm bringing in sanctity, light, peacefulness, harmony, a day of rest for myself and for my whole family. So that's what I do with my two daughters, right? Now, at that moment where I'm about to, again, cover my eyes, make this blessing, think about my family, think about my loved ones, think about all those and what the world needs, I stop, I pause, I reflect, and you guessed, you guessed it. It's my little beautiful coin thing. Again, make sure it's always loaded with coins. Whoever sets up the candles, it's their job to make sure there's coins. And actually on Friday, I don't take one coin and give it in. I give one before the suspicious mitzvah. Actually, you see that it's kind of full right now. So we need to empty it before tomorrow. But I actually give two coins on Friday. And that is because on Shabbat, on Saturday, I'm not going to be um, touching money because it's definitely not part of, you know, commerce and money are definitely not part of the Shabbat vibe. I shouldn't be thinking about what I'm buying and what I'm negotiating and what I'm having. Like it's, it's all about being present, not acquiring it's about being right that's what shabbat vibe is and shabbat's energy is and there's probably so much more to say about that but that's not what we're doing here today so at that day where i'm not going to be handling money i don't want to miss the chance to do the mitzvah i don't want to miss saturdays not doing the mitzvah so my tzedakah box is pretty full i would actually give at that point two coins before shabbat right here right near my candles it stays here weekly and i make sure i'm able to give it now tzedakah that's a great question, and I'll answer that about where the coins go. So what's also interesting is that tzedak, what's interesting also about tzedakah is that um, we, we make sure that we give it daily. We make sure we also know that in, when, in the prayers of the High Holidays, it discusses in many synagogues, we'll say it out loud, Uteshuva, Utefila, Utzedakah, Ma'avirin, Etra, Hagzera, that um, you know, we know Teshua returns to the essence of who we are and prayer and all that and charity, giving tzedakah, doing the right thing with my money is, can eradicate a negative decree or something that's negative about my life. And so people in there, maybe in a crisis, they, they pay attention. Have I given tzedakah? Where am I holding? Because tzedakah brings good energy into life and kind of resets the scale of, of materialism and, and spirituality. One more layer I want to say. One more thing I want to say about tzedakah is a good question came in. Um, a good question came in about um, where does the money go afterwards? So you're right. These charity boxes, that one is full. Where's it going to go? So I'll tell you something so sweet. We had, you know, COVID came, rolled in right after spring break. And I had students that suddenly their lives were changed. And now they're, you know, they're not at in cam on campus. And they're, they're suddenly you know, home for spring break. And now they have to come out and empty their apartments and move forward. And I had one student who drove all the way from, you know, San Antonio, three hours north to empty his apartment um, and go home. And it was a stressful time, an emotional time. I don't have to define you all. We all were living it, right? Well, we know what it was. We, we understand that sudden shock we had when suddenly life came to a screeching halt. And what was so moving and touching is this, this student had learned in the Sinai Scholars class about the value of Zedekah. And, we, and he had a tzedakah box and we gave the tzedakah, um, he, we gave him a tzedakah box at the end of class that he could take one and have it in his apartment. And he said, in, on his way out of town, he stopped by to say goodbye, say thank you for the semester. And he took his full sign and scholar's tzedakah box, which means he was giving coins daily, which is amazing. He took his full sign and scholar's tzedakah box and he handed it to us and he said, I want to give this to Chabad. I want to give this back to give to others. So now tzedakah, who does money go to? So when this fills up, you don't have to go find a poor person on the streets to give this to. You can actually either write a, um, write a check, like who writes checks anymore? You can vet, count how much it is and Venmo the person, that, the organization, that amount of money. Um, you can... Um, either do that, you can Venmo, you know, like the person that amount of money, you can um, write a check if you do that um, and see how much it is, but make sure you're giving that amount to the, tzedakah, the, you know, charity of your choice. And obviously we are careful to give first to, you know, people and to our local community and invest back in what we're doing. I would say the base Khan is a great place to give tzedakah to. They're constantly providing, um, you know, quality learning and engaging material for you know women around the world and so that would be a very an example of a good charity um so you would give 
the money from the box, like that equivalent into the tzedakah box. And I know someone who, because a tenth a miser is so significant and important, when, because miser is so significant and important, she said when she just sees what's in her bank account after her salaries, then she kind of, her mind thinks it's hers. So she said she always, her and her husband have this thing that they take a tenth off and it goes into a separate bank account, their tzedakah bank account. And when aside from giving coins daily, whenever they know that there's someone in need, whether it's a family member or someone else, they actually will donate, they'll go to that account because that's how they, they already calculate that a tenth is not theirs. That a tenth God is giving them as they are the ambassadors to give. And what's fascinating is the, I think a very high percentage of worldwide philanthropy actually is Jewish, comes from Jewish sources because tzedakah is so integral and so a part of who we are in our mindset. And our that's a question. Yeah, go for it. I always wondered because you know how we, we know that um, it's better to give a lot of small amounts than one big amount? Yes. So let's say like it's better to give to like five charity boxes, five cents, instead of giving like 50 cents to one charity box, theoretically. So because right? the more times you give, the more misses you get. So well, it's, with, it, yeah, go ahead. Um, so if that's the case, then why does it parallel to when you're finished giving one donation of everything that's in there to one person that's Put okay in technically like how does that okay great question so i want to i'm going to go i'm going to take uh i'm going to take a left turn here for a second in the field of neurology when we there's a lot of buzz about hardwiring and habits and neuropathways and strengthening neuropathways by doing what just doing it right if we want to make something a part of who we are and we want to make something part of our day-to-day -day routine, the best way to do it is actually to do it. Um, and in Judaism, action is the bottom line. Like we want to do the, the act. You know, there was once a man, a philanthropist, a very rich man, a charitable tzedakah. He had a lot of, gave a lot of tzedakah and he had the Alter Rebbe visiting him. And the Alter Rebbe, hey, and Alter Rebbe the, pre, uh, the, first, the founder of Chabad, the first Chabad Rebbe, he's, um, the man admitted to him, look, I feel a little guilty. I'm very charitable. Everyone knows I'm charitable. I give a lot of tzedakah. Like, my name's everywhere, you know, I feel a little like uncomfortable with all that get, you know, like of being known. And I enjoy the knowledge. I enjoy the like accolades. I enjoy it, honestly. And I have work to do because I enjoy it. And so the altar says, you know, don't stop giving because to the poor man, their stomach is still full. So the way we become givers is actually just training ourselves, doing it consistently. So when, uh, when we're from a young age trained to give tzedakah to daily, give, we're becoming givers. We hardwire that into our thinking. So yes, there's a discussion. If you have a thousand dollars, is it better to give a thousand individual dollars or a thousand dollars at once? Now, if you have a thousand dollars and you can give a thousand individual dollars, oh my goodness, give day, week, month, year, go for it. Like no one's going to say that's bad. But every time we're doing a physical action, especially when we're doing with intentionality and we're doing with, um, as I said earlier, the hierarchy of stuff, we're doing it and we're proud to do it and we're happy to do it, then. Um, and, and in this case, let's say I'm giving, I don't know who it's going to. This is a very high level of stuff when you don't know who it's going to necessarily. Someone tells me someone's in need. I'm going to give it to them. No problem. So when we give daily, we are becoming givers. We're hardwiring ourselves. And every time we do a physical action with something material, like a coin, like my materialism, at that moment that I'm giving the quarter, I'm not just giving the quarter. I'm giving all that energy and everything. How I got that quarter is invested in that giving. Yes. Is it delayed? Meaning it's not going to the poor person until it's full. Yeah, that's true. That's true. But remember God, that the goodness that we do in this world, it's not just lit. Like it's, there's not a limit to like, if I'm doing it today or tomorrow. Now, obviously if every day you can go and find someone, if you're walking down the street and there's someone you can give a dollar to or whatever, like by all means give directly, directly at that moment, but just strategically and realistically, we'd have to be giving, you know, like I can't every day empty this. I, I've, I have more than one job. You know what I mean? Like halacha and Jewish law is very realistic. So I don't know if I fully answered your question, but I hope it did. Yes? Um, I, it's a little bit of a buzz. I can't really hear. Sorry. Um, you're good. No, just a, like when you do empty it, Manya, right? Yes, sorry. You give it to one person, no? Not Usually. necessarily. I'm giving it, no, not necessarily. Not necessarily. And that one person, 
Okay, there's the recipient I'm receiving. Let's say, let's say someone needs it, and you're giving them, let's say I empty this content and it's $25 and I walk and I know a student's in need and they're and I give them the $25. Are you saying it's only one mitzvah because it's only $25? Right. I think I think you actually did answer it because you're kind of saying that the energy of giving it a lot of time was done in the moment when you gave it. Even Correct. if later it ends up going to one person. To also, God. like the Aldrebi story, that one person doesn't, right. that the hungry man doesn't care. They just have the bread in their stomach. You know what I mean? Right. That, that's, right. you understand the answer to the story, that, that, why yeah. that story, that makes sense now? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Good. Any Mom, other questions? Mon, yeah, I have a question. Yeah, sure. Um, so you kind of, oh, sorry, you kind of touched on this when you were talking about the student that like takes a separate bank account for the 10%, but if, if we're supposed to give every day, how are we supposed to calculate like what 10% awesome. is? Awesome. I, I don't count this in my 10% of giving. 10% plus a coin a day, okay? I have to tell you, it's, there's this notion that when I have a job or when I hit my 401, you know, when I buy a house or when I buy my girlfriend her diamond ring, that's when I, when I have a child, when I start my, my kid's college fund, that's when I'll start giving. We're supposed to start giving every single day. You babysit, you have a summer internship, 10% of it. Start training yourself to be a giver. It's so good to be on the giving end. Oh, no, I, so I would do is I would swap in some of the money for coins, like literally go to the bank and get rolls. I do that. I get rolls of coins, pennies, nickels that I can, you know, quarters that I can have around and have a tzedakah box. And you know what happens when you have a tzedakah box in your room? You, every time you see it, you're sending yourself a message. You're, set, you're setting a tone for the space, which is why our children have, you know, everyone has a tzedakah box in their own room because their room is their own space. And we want to make sure that in their mind, that tzedakah is a part of their mind as well. That, does that answer your question? Meaning I, would, I wouldn't yeah. necessarily, like, look, my personality, if I, let's say, had a summer internship and I had to give $1,000, I'm not going to, oh, cash in $10 and now give, okay, I'm going to give $990, right? I, I'm going to, it's okay, the $10 I'm giving with this, but Everyone has to be realistic to who they are and where they're at or whatever. That, that example of the couple who has that bank account, it's just was her mindset of how to set herself up that she didn't feel like, oh my gosh, like how much do I need to give and how much is mine and how much isn't, or oh my gosh, all that money just left my account. She wanted to have, like that was her strategy. It's not, that's not a halachic or that's not a, that's her way of making sure she's able to really incorporate giving in her life. Okay, thank you. I have a question. Yeah, sure. So what do you do when you're doing that? You're giving your daily points, you're giving 10%, but on the street, there you're always confronted with people who are asking for money. And sometimes they, they're the people and what do you do? So there's a lot, there's an interesting thing because this is this is where it gets a little tricky. So first of all, you can always give more. Fine. But sometimes, and we have to, it's, it's a, maybe a, an ethical conversation and it's longer than a mitzvah minute, but the whole notion of, I remember once I was um, outside of a supermarket and this man who said, you know, can you give me money? I'm hungry. I don't have food. And I said, you know, I'm going into the store. I'm happy to buy you food. And that's happened before where I've gone into the store and bought that person meat and, and, and cheese and a loaf of bread. Here's food. Because it looked like I didn't want to be a partner in helping that person have money that they were going to use in a way that wasn't healthy for them. Maybe, you know, drugs or things that were not healthy. Um, and so I've, I've had it once where I offered someone food and they yelled at me and said, just give me your money. And I was like, well, no, that's not going to really work. So yes, it should, we should feel like when I pass someone who's on the street and who needs money or needs something, I, I, it tugs at me. We are hardwired to be merciful. Jews were known as, we're, we're, we sh we're merciful. It's a value system. It's a mindset we inherited in our DNA from our forefathers. And that's a whole conversation, you know, a couple of the conversation about what we inherited in our genetic DNA as being merciful people. You should feel something. But that being said, that doesn't mean, that doesn't mean that we um, need to give every time we pass someone on the street tons of money. Instead, maybe we can assist them in getting to a, a resource or a place, or maybe I can give it to the homeless shelters because I know that they're going to reach out to these people. So there's, I wouldn't want to give an ethical ruling, but I would say they are, it is a lot more complex. Does that make sense? Because sometimes you're an enabler and you're helping someone stay in an unhealthy situation. 
and sometimes you're you know so there there are a lot of factors and i would i would say maybe to discuss it with someone like more of the details Does that makes sense what i'm saying yeah thank you oh, okay i have a question go for it um at what point are you no longer required to not individual coins but the quote unquote, like the 10 percent at what point are you like for instance i don't have an income anymore um, I pay what bills I have based on the charity of my family members. So am I still responsible to give 10% of the charity my family gives to me? That's a really good question. I want to answer it with a, one of my favorite children's storybooks about a young boy, a young girl who's walking in Israel and she sees this man who was always making shoes. I'm going to do this really quickly because it's an incredible book. It's called The Last Pair of Shoes. And this, she, he, she sees this shoemaker and she asks him, and she knew he came from, you know, Europe from war. He, she didn't know she. So it was rainy. She ducks into his little uh, kiosk, or it's not even a store, right? And and um, she asks him about, you know, what he did and how he's making shoes and how he learned. And he says, and she says, you know, you're a shoemaker. Why are your shoes so old? Right? The shoemaker is why is he wearing old shoes? So he tells her a story of when he was a child, um, the war rolled in. His father had made shoes, and his father taught him how to make shoes, leather shoes the trade and the war rolled in and his father was called to war and um or drafted a lot of times they drafted a lot of um jewish men and put them in the fronts with pitch pitchforks it was unfortunate and um many people lost their lives inadequately that you know with inadequate equipment and protection and they weren't soldiers um so her, her, her his father was called to you know called up in that case and so he first, you know, so he started right away making shoes to support the family. And um, anyway, suddenly his father's not coming back and he's running out of supplies and the war is raging and they're starting to go hungry. And suddenly he looks and realizes this is enough leather for one more pair of shoes. And he himself has only, um, his shoes are ripped. And he now realizes he's gonna have to start going around town to town and fixing shoes. It's the only way to make money. He doesn't have supplies to make more shoes. Well. He makes himself a pair of shoes and he, because his, his mother, his siblings, they're starving. He needs to, right? And um, so what does he do? He makes a pair of shoes and as he's about to leave the shop and close the door, a man walks and says, I need shoes. And he says, I'm sorry, I have no more shoes. And the, the young boy says, um, so the man says, no, no, my, my, I go out at night. My shoes, look, they're ripped. My feet are frozen. I go out at night and I connect, collect Kindle wood from the, from the forest. And it's winter and I need shoes. My, I will frostbite. My family's going to starve. I need these shoes. And the boy says, I, I, I'm now the breadwinner for my family and I need these shoes. I don't know what to do. And the boy says, what about we share the shoes? And so the man used the shoes at night and the boy used the shoes during the day. And for, ye for months, for months, this went on. For months, this went on. Well, and suddenly one day the man never returned with the shoes in the morning. And the boy was now with no shoes, but his family needed food. And he went out without shoes to go provide for his family. Well, sure enough, move forward. The war ends and the man doesn't come back. And now he's really in a situation. One day, two days, three days, suddenly the man comes back a week later with a pile of leather and strings and straps and says, I want to repay you for your kindness. The war is over. I was here supplies. And he said, the man gave me back the shoes and I never took those shoes off to remind me that you're never too poor to give to someone else. It's not always about dollars. There's many ways we can give. In this case, that last pair of shoes saved a family's life. So think of other ways you can give. You can volunteer. You can get, there's so many ways to give. Focus on being a giver. It's a much better place to be a giver than a taker. Wow, thank you, Manya. What an absolutely powerful note to end on. Yes. Um, and I also want to point out that there are, there, there are there came, some really good questions came up about the actual laws of tzedakah. Like for example, the laws, there are two different mitzvahs. To give a tenth is one mitzvah. To give right. a tenth is another mitzvah. So yes. that, you know, that there are two Thank mitzvahs you. that you can do. And Doesn't definitely detract. <laughs> exactly. And, go, and, and when someone stands in front of you and needs something, you don't sit and calculate how much, you know, so there are yeah. different laws. 
also that there also there's also big things about giving a big chunk at once there's a different kind of holiness that pulls down so yeah don't feel um, discouraged about that. The only reason I'm bringing this up is because when you go to Chabad.org, you can actually see, you can find the laws of tzedakah and how beautiful it would be if we get together as a group after the retreat and meet once a week for 20 minutes and just read through some of those laws and, and actually have the, the confidence of un understanding the different details. So Mani, yes. thank you so much. Yeah, look, we're, we're, I, I think it's pretty clear that obviously we're trying to learn expose ourselves to the extent that we can to the mitzvah. And then we have to, we always, like I said yesterday, we got to dig deeper, right? We always got to dig deeper. We got to own it. But what, what, if you walk away with the idea of becoming a giver and you walk away with the idea um, of A, becoming a giver and B, um, just finding little ways day to day to live a little higher, a little beyond yourself, that alone Amazing. accomplish something.